Welcome to Welcome Porcelain Peak, a strange, a strange and scary, scary podcast, podcast covering, all covering all things horror, things horror and science, science fiction. fiction. All right, thank you, as always, for the lovely introduction. So, how are my boys doing uh, with their quarantining? Not much has changed for me, because I'm still working and still hanging out with you guys. Like I said last week, I just can't go to the fucking movies, but it's nothing out anyway, so it's not really doing too much for me. Yeah, I am still pretty bored, st- <laughs> but... but I did save a little spooky story in a uh, in the vein of things that are happening to me. I the other day was laying in my room, and I was <laughs> writing or editing for my new YouTube show, Here Be Monsters, on YouTube.com, and um, I decide, okay, I, I I give a little look to my right, nothing, it's nothing there. Give a little look to my left. All of my DVDs and Blu-rays that I just organized earlier that day, they're all there where they're supposed to be, except for two that have mysteriously been pulled from the shelf toward me. It was The Conjuring and The Conjuring 2! (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so... That, that was pretty spooky, yeah. That really happened? Yeah, that happened. I looked over and those and were the, you don't know why? Those were the only two movies that were stuck out. Mm. I'm pretty sure that I just did a bad job organizing them, so I just <laughs> Yeah, the more you explain it, the worse it gets. It's like Michael Myers being part of that cult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um then I just pushed the the DVDs back in where they're supposed to go and watch something else. Yeah. Yeah, that's how my life is going. That's how incredibly bored I am at home is weaving uh, scary, spooky webs out of DVDs <laughs> being misplaced. That is scary, though. Yeah. Yeah, it's been, it's still been pretty rough. I've been taking over some of the, the editing responsibilities, so that has given me something to do, plus watching the garbage movies that we'll talk about later. But yeah, it's been, it's been pretty rough. But I'm glad to have my boys in all of this. It makes my life a lot easier, and it makes it so that I have some reason to not fully withdraw into a into a shell of emotions <laughs> into a pit of despair <laughs> this is me in a nutshell <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so um as we mentioned last week this is going to be our shit movie olympics as we're calling it the first annual shit movie olympics i don't know if it's gonna be I, annual i think and i don't know if i ever want to do it again <laughs> <laughs> i think that we should i think that we should just that's how you know it was a successful risk. shit movie olympics yeah, yeah. i think that yeah. that we should just be more mindful and spread these things out a little bit more instead of trying to pound them all out in a day because that's that's a rough sell uh but yeah, pounding out three in a day is rough <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah this sh- it should be at least an interesting discussion um but before we do all of that let's hop into some news <laughs> This is it, Jennifer. You're big breaking TV. Fuck the front time, bitch. This just in, California's in lockdown. Ooh. Ooh. This just in, New Mutants is still not coming out. <laughs> Yeah, so I have a little bit of news. Um, probably should have mentioned this last episode, but uh, Stuart Gordon recently passed um, on the 24th, mm. um, which is sad news for anyone who's a fan of like Reanimator, From Beyond, Castle Freak. Um, he was known for his kind of theatrical, over the top, weird like love crap, love crap. <laughs> Lovecraft interpretations, but anyone who's into his brand of horror, I think, is going to definitely miss his presence in the scene. So rest in peace to another horror great. So it's sad to see him go. So yeah, that's the uh, sad, sad news. John, you got anything for us this I week? I have some better news. Okay, uh, so good. as far as that, as far as uh, horror releases are concerned, obviously with the theaters being closed, that's that's kind of a dead zone. There aren't a lot of things coming out. You know, there are a few things that were left over that are being brought out to VOD a little early, which is nice. Uh, but the one thing that we have to look forward to is, uh, at time of recording, we'll, in a few days, have Resident Evil 3 Nemesis Remake, 
which has gotten the review embargo removed and now has some reviews coming out. And people are loving it. It looks great. The demo plays really well. It should be interesting to see how it turns out as far as it having kind of that nemesis mechanic to it a little bit. But it seems very scary, very atmospheric, you know, good survival horror time. So I would definitely suggest if you're not going to play it to find a good YouTuber to check out their playthrough. I'm sure those will probably start coming in around Friday in order to kind of keep the the spoilers and that sort of stuff at bay for a game that the original came out in the 90s. <laughs> what but, uh, what platforms is that going to be released on? Um, so it will be on, I believe, PS4, Xbox One, and then probably PC. Okay. If you have a Switch, sorry, it's not coming out to Switch. Um, but I know for sure that the likelihood of getting a Scary Game Squad playthrough of it will probably be pretty high. So if you want to watch some people play it, if you don't have the means to do it on your own, they're a good group to watch. Cool. Yeah, I definitely want to check it out. I've been thinking about like getting into a video game. And right now, horror is all I'm really thinking about. So I was thinking about either going back and doing like Resident Evil 7 or... So um, I would say uh, you could feasibly do 7 very inexpensively. And 7 has a batshit fucking crazy story. I would definitely suggest to check it out. It is... I thought you had 7. I did at one point, but that was back when I was like... I had my very minimalist game collection where it was like I would have two games and then I would trade them in whenever a new thing came out. So right. I think I've like long since traded it in for no money. Thanks, GameStop. Glad you're going out of business. Damn. No. <laughs> That's the Texas Chainsaw-esque one. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, like I said, the story in it is fucking crazy and it has a weird way that it ties back to being like a Resident Evil style story, which is, which is tight. Resident Evil 2, the remake, is practically flawless it's a new imagining of that style of game kind of similar controls to something you would see in like a resi four five or six but in that do you say resi yeah so is that what, is that what we're calling them but resi is a, is a shorthand for it all right the res i believe you um the reza <laughs> when, when horror games start rapping yeah. the, the resi the jesse <laughs> uh but yeah i would say that any of them are are a good pick the, like I said, the graphical style in in Resident Evil 2 and the one that's coming out on Friday, those ones look absolutely flawless. Cool. Ab, ab fab. Ab fab. Re, ab fab resi. Ab fab resi. I'm down. I'm down. So is that all we got for news this week? I got not anything because we just recorded basically a couple days ago and there was hardly any news yeah, there. And news. We took a fucking four month break. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, it's been a little bit of a dry, dry desert. Slim news. pickings, nerds. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll take the news where we can get it. But other than that, let's hop into that trivia. Trivia. Let's see if JB can hold the crown. I was about to say, I, was about to say, I, I got my annual win. So, I, <laughs> so I'm... Yeah. <laughs> annual Olympics for the annual win. As Spider-Man would say, everybody gets one. All right. Per usual, I will be reading to John. John will be reading to Anthony Silva. And Mr. Silva will be reading to me. And our first category is Monster. John, what actor played Ash in Army of Darkness from 1992? <laughs> That's Bruce Campbell. That is Bruce Campbell. It's so weird. I was just about to, uh, I was just thinking about an Evil Dead video I just watched. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In what country is Ginger Snaps from 2000 set? <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to assume from the question that that means it's not set in the United States. Um, Canada. It is Canada. Oh. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> All right, in your monster category, Anthony Perez, you got in Fright Night from 1985. What is the name of the former film star that Charlie comes to for help? Fuck. It's been a long time since I've seen that. Chris Angel. Ooh, so close. It's Peter Vincent. Mm. I was going to guess Big Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, at the end of round one, it is 1-1-0, one, one, and we're going to head into gore slash disturbing John, the director of Freaks from 1932, also directed what 1931 Universal monster film? Oh, it's kind of a, it's a limited number of things, at least. I'm going to say... You were hot on the guesses last week. Yeah. You make it happen again. Yeah, I'm going to say 
Invisible Man. Ooh, solid guess, but it was Dracula. Uh, Dracula was my second guess. Dracula. Todd Browning, Mm. who is one of the characters from Final Destination. I don't know if you know that. I did not know that. Yeah, one of the kids that is on the plane, his name is Todd Browning. Oh, I do remember Todd. Yeah, Todd. He's a good guy. (laughs) (laughs) Named after Todd Browning. All right. Uh, In House of a Thousand Corpses from 2003, what is the surname of the monstrous family torturing the protagonist? Is it Firefly? It is Firefly. Nice. The Firefly family. I can feel feel that crown just slipping away, (laughs) going back to its rightful owners. Well, we're getting one of those weird uh, confluences in our cards because we have another Evil Dead question for you, Anthony. What horror novelist helped Evil Dead from 1981 acquire a distributor? I don't know. Um, Clive Barker. Ooh, Stephen King. Was Stephen it? King was a big Bitch. fan of Evil Dead. Stevie Key. That's like the most obvious guess. That's why I didn't want to do it. Anyway, at the end of round two, it is one, two, and zero. I got the John Bug, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no offense. <laughs> All right. Here we go for round three with Psychological. John in The Invitation from 2015. What was the name of the deceased son of Eden and Will? What's that kid's name? That's going to be a hard pull, and I'm going to say... Sam. Dude, it's Ty. (laughs) (laughs) Brutal. Yeah, sorry. (laughs) Why you gotta do me like that, homie? All right, uh, Dead of Night from 1945 had how many separate directors? Three. Ah, it's close. It's a four. Damn. Uh, They are Alberto uh, Cavalcanti, Charles Crichton, Robert Hammer, and Basil Dearden. We should add that to our list of things this trivia has mentioned that we haven't seen. Has anybody seen that? Nope. Mm-mm. Cool. That, that's hard, Norp. All right, continuing the... It's, it's that, <clears throat> Village of the Damned, and that one... Midnight Meat Train. Midnight Meat Train, but then there's that one, I think it's in Past the Popcorn, where it's like some dude inhales a bunch of like insecticide and trips balls. Don't know. We that sounds like some, into that it. sounds like some uh, Cronenberg shit. Yeah, I forget what it was. Is it Bugs? Probably. I don't know. It's a bug's (laughs) life. (laughs) All right. To continue the rhyming of our trivia game, our next question is, in The Invisible Man from 1933, what allows police to discern the location of the invisible man? His footprints, his shadow, or his breath? I will say footprints. You got it. It was his footprints. On the board. All right. Let me lose my breasts. All right, at the end of that round, it leaves us with one, two, one, as we move tight into game, game. Paranormal. John J.B. Brasher, what is the name of the entity communicating with the youngest Freeling child in Poltergeist from 1982? What's that, what's that entity's name, John? What's that entity's name? I could tell you I could tell you the one from The Exorcist, the one from Poltergeist. Azuzu. Uh, yeah, as I would say. Uh, the one from uh, Poltergeist, I'm not sure, so I'm going to go with... A nice, classic, Charles Fuck. It is The Beast. Mm. Nice okay. Yeah. Oh, so it was James McAvoy. Yep. <laughs> All right. So The House in We Are Still Here from 2015 needs fresh souls every how many years? I've seen this movie, but it was a very long time ago. It's not super memorable. Every 25 years. Ah, so close. 30. 30 years. Ooh, Damn. 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 All right. (laughs) Got a softball for you here, Anthony. Sick. In Paranormal, in Insidious from 2010, Dalton Lambert inherited his ability to astral project from which of his parents? His father. His papa. Yep. (laughs) Papa. Josh. (laughs) It says his father, Josh Lambert, as portrayed by Patrick Wilson. Oh, wow. I, I, I love it when they give just random details on one of them. And now I officially feel like I'm back in my place. Why? Behind the two of you. It's one, two, two? Yep. One, two, two. He's the, he's the rear of the human centipede. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah, I'm right. I'm definitely the one that eats the shit. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, we got a tight game here. It's anyone's game, and we're going to go ahead and move into Killer John. What is the relationship between Papa Jupiter and Ruby in The Hills Have Eyes from 1977? I'm going to say father and child. Could you be more specific? Daughter? Yes, that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Wow. Oh, it's anyone's game right here. This is crazy. It feels good. All right. Sweating. <laughs> Sweating. What is the color of the recurring hooded raincoat worn by the killer in Alice Sweet Alice from 1976? Is it red? 
No, it's yellow. God damn it, that was my second old, guess. Classic. Old classic raincoat colors. Damn. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anthony P., what is the profession of the father of Mark Lewis in Peeping Tom from 1960? A janitor. No, he's a piss, 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 psychologist. <laughs> 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 Well, all right then. So, so that's a tie game. Yeah, tied all up. Two, 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 a two, two, two. As we move into everyone's favorite category, international is the final round. John, do you have what it takes? Probably not. In the opening of Suicide Club from two thousand one, how many school children are in the group of victims at the train station? Tight. Haven't seen it. I'm gonna say seven. That is how you say way off. It's 54. Tie. Whoa. All right. Uh, what, <laughs> what is the country of origin of the titular bird in The Bird with the Crystal Plumage from 1970? I believe this is an Argento film, if I'm not mistaken. The, the bird with the crystal plumage. Crystal plumage. It's my favorite Indiana Jones sequel. <laughs> 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 Couldn't have been better. Couldn't have been worse than the last one. Man. Yeah. That's right. It is Argento. I'm going to say it's from Rome. It is not from Rome. It is from Serbia. Damn. All right, Anthony. Bring he us put, home. He put it in your head because you said Argento. Yeah, that's what it was. In The Devil's Backbone, 2001, what type of undischarged weapon rests nose down in the courtyard of the orphanage? A gun? It's a bomb. It's an uh, undischarged it. bomb. So is that, is that a tie? That's a tie game. Ooh, Ooh. knife fight. We're we're two for three so far. What do we want to do with this tie game business? You just draw a card, read the question, and then whoever gets the answer first will just win. Okay, ready? Yeah. The Mist, 2007, was based on the novella of the same name by what author? Stephen Stephen King. King. (laughs) So we're still tied, baby. (laughs) Okay. In Green Room from 2015, what is the name of the punk band the protagonist comprised? I think I'm out on this one. The... Sex fuckers. The ain't rights. Mm, that was mm. so close. Okay. What prison break actor wrote the screenplay for Stoker? I don't know his name, so I, I'm that out one, on that one. That too. one bald dude. What is his name? He has some stupid name. Wentworth Miller. Oh, you're probably right, dude. Yes! Oh! Dig. I'm hella sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's funny. That's funny. I wasn't expecting that to be the winner, but all right. Yeah. All right. Con- oh, congrats for, for reclaiming the crown. Ooh, feels good. I said, it, like I said, I I think this is probably my best two weeks if since since Stranger Things. I think quarant- <laughs> quarantine's doing doing you some good. Yeah, yeah. just I'm making not, me. I'm not quarantined. I think quarantine's fucking you too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if you enjoyed that titillating trivia and that very scant news, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and subscribe so you never miss out on a single episode of this show. And while you're at it, listen in for some main dish. I know this steak doesn't exist. I know that when I put it in my mouth, the Matrix is telling my brain that it is juicy and delicious. After nine years, you know what I realize? Ignorance is bliss. So, this was my idea, so I will take the reins here. This is the shit movie Olympics. So, we all came up with the shittiest movie that we could think of off the top of our heads. And um, other names that could have worked were Dumpster Fire Olympics, (laughs) Hot Trash Olympics, Never Watch These Movies Olympics. Honestly, I probably would watch two of them again. One of them is one of them is a one and done type of scenario for sure. But yes, I would watch one of the no, I would watch two of these again for sure, for sure. So essentially, what we're gonna do in this is we're uh, chopping these up into three categories, taking the scores that we all give it combined out of a total of forty five to figure out which movie is the shittiest movie we could think of. Um, so the three movies are the Greasy Strangler which was Silva's entry. Pinata, Survival Island, otherwise known as Demon Hunter? Demon Island. Demon Island um, by Perez. And then Axum uh, from me, which I think also has another title, but I don't remember what it is. 
And so essentially the categories are going to be entertainment value. Uh, that's a one to five scale um, with a couple of modifiers. Um, if there are, if there is nudity, that is worth a point. If there, um, if it is funny and meant to be, it's worth points. If it's funny unintentionally, that's also worth points, but could potentially be a negative in the next category, which is technical on a one to five scale. And a, and then the final is story. So from there, um, the scores will basically work out to the lowest score you could possibly get is a three. And the highest score, obviously, you could get is, is a 15 from each person. So the lowest total score you could get is nine, um, which I think we have some that are going to be pretty, pretty close to that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to let you hold my hand through because the, there's a lot of math. So let's just get into yeah. it. Uh, yeah, I got lost when I tried to carry the four. So. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, you want to just go by movie by movie? Yeah, let's go movie by movie. All right, let's just go ahead and start with Pinata. This movie. <laughs> what was that? A, a fart sound effect? Uh, I just thought I would spice the episode up yeah, a little no, bit. I so I <laughs> got a little fart board here. Um, this movie, if you haven't seen it, is about a tribe that used to live on an island and they were on hard times. And so they decided to put their bad juju into a piñata. Oh, you can't you can't say that. You can't. You can't say uh, juju. the J word. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the juju. Uh, and then years later, a college goes to that island to fuck each other. Apparently, they're, they're there to, to do, do a scavenger, scavenger a Cinco de Mayo of, scavenger hunt of underwear <laughs> of underwear. And the piñata doesn't like that. Comes to life and wrecks. Yeah, wrecks some house. And that's pretty much it. Um, it has the dude from Buffy. It also yeah. has it Which also is, has an in her prime Jamie Presley. Uh, yes, yep. Definitely in her prime. And I was very excited to see Nicholas Brendan 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 in this. Um I like him a lot from Buffy and also from a little movie called Coherence, mm. which is a really really good little sci-fi movie. This not so much. But I would say out of the three movies we watched, this was probably the most movie like movie like. <laughs> yeah, well and, and this yeah. was the most like just this is a by the books ish slasher type thing where there wasn't anything like so terribly weird about it that it stood out. Right. So, Aside yeah. from the pinata. Yeah, no, but I mean like <laughs> even that like felt very like late nineties, early two thousands, like when they just discovered CG, which is why I said at the end, I was like, this movie definitely had like a uh, Scooby-Doo in the cyber chase sort of charm because when the pinata turns into like a uh, CG ghost pinata thing and is chasing people through the woods, <laughs> I, I was like, this is actually pretty charming for a good, bad movie. Yeah. Like I, I, I liked it enough. I, I was bored, but there's, there's a, there's a level of nostalgic comfort in the fact that it is so unapologetically late nineties, early two thousands, just, schlock well yeah it literally opens with like all of them getting drunk on a boat like all these college people getting drunk on a boat and to like a uh very like early 2000s song about like one in a fiesta yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. aside from because the actual opening of that movie is the biggest hurdle to get through in my opinion for that movie which is just a narrator explaining the process of this weird pinata to store all of their their bad vibes being crafted very difficult to watch. I don't know how yeah. historically accurate Pinata Survival Island is, but I was actually pretty interested in that opening narration. If that's actually where the idea of pinatas comes from, like you make a good pinata and you make a bad pinata, and then you set the pin the bad pinata out just like into the water, because you're like that's never gonna run into anybody. And then obviously, you know, it runs into runs people. into a group of teenagers looking for underwear. Yeah, that's a good woods. question. I, I mean, I doubt that that's at all historically accurate, <laughs> but it would be cool to see the origin of pinata. If that has any relation to that. Um, I think that the acting wasn't awful. Like, it was fine. Yeah. It was ex what you expect from a bad movie, especially with the cast. I think I recognized one other person, one or two from other things, like side characters and other things, and a little bit over the top. Yeah, it's a, a like little rough. But overacted. Not, but not like the room rough. Like, no, it, like, no, it, like no. they, you can tell these people were actual actors attempting to act. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, graphics were, like you said, pretty rough. Uh, the pinata vision was fucking hilarious. It was like low budget predator. Yeah. Um, which was already low budget for the time. You know what I mean? Uh, so that was funny, but no nudity. Yeah. It's very disappointing. So that was, that's, they were all hella drunk looking for underwear. I was like, let me see something. And there was nothing. Um, and, uh, like very straightforward slasher ideas where oh, you know, we're drinking, we're smoking. We might be hooking up. I don't think anyone said I'll be right back, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. I just liked that it they 
played into the idea that like a pinata attacking people is very stupid. Like for the whole movie, like when they go, when people run into the pinata and then they go and tell other people, other people spend a good amount of the time being like, okay, that no, like <laughs> that's stupid. And then even at the, like the very end of the movie, when the police or the paramedics or whatever show up on the, at the Island or whatever. And they're like, what happened? And the characters just kind of look at each other like, well, they're never going to believe us. <laughs> 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 And a lot of people were hung, and even the pinata dropped down. And I was like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. Well, and like, I like that, like, all very pinata. Well, and that's why another reason why I said it felt very Scooby Doo is that um, at the end they do like a, we're making a, a trap, like montage. <laughs> yeah. And they make a trap that literally turns the pinata into another pinata because they hang him from a tree and then they start him on fire and start like beating him with shit. <laughs> but, Love a good montage. I was like, when that happened, I was like, hey, here we go. I want that on the I want that on the scoring sheet. Is there a good montage? Yeah, <laughs> I I do think that like the fact that this movie doesn't take itself too seriously and is a little tongue in cheek when it comes to certain things, I think that does add to the entertainment value, and it definitely means that somewhat they meant this to be a little comedic, and it somewhat lands because a lot of the moments are laughable, if not actually funny. Right. So how how do you want to do it? What's the first thing we need to look at? Let's so, score this bitch. So we'll go through entertainment first. Obviously, doesn't get any points for nudity. I gave this movie a three in entertainment value because it is sometimes unintentionally, but sometimes intentionally funny. I'll say a three. Yeah, I think three works. Yeah, yeah, I think three is fair for all sure. Right, so we're three in entertainment for all of us. Uh, technical standpoint, I'm gonna say this is probably a like a two. It's hard to say because. We watched it on YouTube, and so I don't know about you guys, but the quality was rough. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not including that because that, like I said, there's only one of these movies that was made in this decade or the last decade. Um, so it is something where um, the quality of the actual image itself, I didn't, I didn't right. add as a qualifier, but like the effects and everything are a little rough in that movie. Um, the shots are super, um, super a sign of their time. Right. I mean, like I said, it it screams late '90s early 2000s movie so for that i think i let me double check i'm pretty sure i gave it a 2.5 i'll go two two 2.5 yeah i feel comfortable there because i was gonna go three but i feel like three is a little bit high yeah 2.5 is good because i do think that the effects for being bad like for this kind of movie to me it worked like i liked that the pinata looked like shit and looked like shitty cg because it fit the tone of the rest of the movie yeah um it felt very very like sci-fi in that like sci-fi channel in that yeah area. like a sci-fi channel movie which so you, this is what we're at 16 i uh, so i'll we'll calculate everything up all all the okay. end don't right. get your pants and then as far twist. as the story is concerned i gave it a two it's not the worst story i've ever heard they at least attempted to try to tie it back to some kind of lore the dialogue is rough in a lot of places the like acting performances are a little a little a little hammy um but like I said, it's not anything that's terrible. It doesn't completely ruin the movie. But like the that six minute scene in the beginning where they're narrating and explaining everything to you was just a little a little much for me. I'm gonna go three yeah, because I feel like, especially compared to the other two, this had the most straightforward story. Yeah, and it was like here's the story. This is the plot. This is what's happening. It was pretty yeah. pretty laid out, and then waiting to get picked off. Um, and we'll talk about why that's not the case with some of these other ones. I'd almost go even higher than that. Uh, uh, higher than that, honestly, just for exactly what you just said, which is I I would even give it like a three point five uh, to a four, but probably like a three point five, just because you're gonna do three point five. Yeah, just because it was a very simple, straightforward story. Like it wasn't confusing. It and yeah, like it wasn't expertly done in terms of the way they delivered the exposition in the beginning. Right. But I'm glad it wasn't like t- a text scroll. Uh, explaining like the pinata thing at least it had some cool imagery there was a really cool shot in the beginning where they're like taking the heart out of the evil person or whatever and then they like lower it down and there's like a a big clay person or something and i don't know that some of the shots i was actually like this is kind of cool for the budget that they had so yeah i would say probably like a 3.5 just because i agree compared to like the kind of scores i want to give the other movies that we watched (laughs) like i have to keep that in mind while i'm ranking this one yeah i just this one wasn't it i mean i i also had the um the lack of benefit of watching this after uh, a particular movie had already kind of spoiled my mood. Uh, We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, But so that brings the total score of 24.5 out of 45. Uh, So I gave it a 7.5 total. Uh, AP gave it an eight. Silva gave it a nine. Uh, So that totals up. Like I said, it's 24.5, which is 
Let's just round that up to a solid 25, I think. Yeah, that's fine with me. Let's yeah. just round them up just so that we yeah. have solid numbers at the end. All right. So 25 out of 45, which is. What's the percentage on that? Um, It's over 50. It's still a fail, but it's not not a, a total and complete failure. I'd be interested to see if that was like translated to the rotten score. Oh, yeah. Like if it's certified. Is, is 60% certified fresh? I think it's 65. Five? It's either sixty or sixty-five, but I don't believe that this particular movie has any like more than one rating on on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh. Um, I think the only one that does is the Greasy Strangler. Because honestly, and my... the Greasy Strangler has like is like certified fresh. It's produced by Elijah Wood, bro. You didn't know that? Yeah, it's from Fantastic Fest. It, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it, yeah. The, mine is the most legit movie out of all three of ours. Yeah. Just gonna say that. But anyway, we'll get to it. <laughs> Do we want to save that one for last, or do we want to hop into Axum? Well, it seems like the one that everybody hates the most, so we can save that one for last. All right. Let's talk about Axum. So the one that I brought to the table is Axum. It is a movie from the, I believe, the early 90s. 1992. Yeah, and it year is. Year I was born. And so it was a, I want to say it was like a film student dropouts, like for, like their passion project and their foray into making films. And like they actually like secured a small budget for it which they didn't use on anything. And um, they proceeded to make uh, one of the most technically hamstrung movies I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, so as far as the movie goes, basically there's this, there's this guy who kills his entire family and then himself. He was a mean townsman. He was a mean the, townsman. Yeah. Uh, the little, the little text crawl in the beginning is, is hard to decipher because yeah. it's not written properly. Yeah, I was gonna say, speaking of movies that have text crawls in the beginning, like for exposition. Yeah. And, this text crawl does nothing to really explain anything, anything, but there apparently is now a man who's out seeking to revenge his family. Not not avenge, but revenge his family. And it's a rough fucking sell. Because he, he killed all his kids except one, right? Yes. And as far as that goes, from there, trying to make out the story is pretty imperceptible. Uh, the audio in this movie is almost laughably bad. It is to the point where in most scenes, you can't even tell people are talking. It's just... <laughs> Uh, but these kids go on like a weekend getaway to a cabin and then cabin in the woods. Classic. Yep. yep, classic. Cab yep cabin in the woods. And then they get attacked by a dude who by Axum. Yeah. Who almost exclusively uses everything but an ax. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not even how it's spelled. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh... so there are a couple things in this movie that are like, like laugh out loud. Hilarious. The scene where where the killer goes in and he he goes and gets that old man when he's just walking around in his house and he's like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> yeah, I mean you you can't talk about this movie without talking about the scene where he's gonna kill the, the one dude with the glasses. Yeah, and the he, the guy puts his fingers at the back of his glasses and does like a doing wing <laughs> like with his glasses before he gets killed. So I mean, for anybody who hasn't seen this, I I would say this movie I had a really hard time in terms of, or I might have a really hard time giving it scores in, in these categories just because it's really hard to even call this a movie. It's like a collection of clips of a group of friends together that uh, was shot with a single camera. Um, no audio equipment. No it's audio equipment whatsoever. Equipment. Yeah. Uh, like you said, there's basically no plot. Just you're watching mindless conversations that people are having that you can barely understand mixed in with all the extras talking. So obviously he didn't learn enough in film school to understand that like when you have extras on, on set, they don't actually talk. They just pretend so you can hear the people. <laughs> but it's that. And then occasionally there'll just be an, a, a death scene. Yeah. And then some really, really, really in your face. Like they were very excited about the music they got. Like score that goes oh, over it. Oh, it's mixed it. above everything else by a mile. Yeah. It's not in the background ever. It, it'll cover up dialogue in some I situations. I thought that was plus because there are some beats where I was like, oh, yeah, that's, 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 that's a good one. That's I'd a good one. That. Hey, like, and then they play that? the whole song. They don't They don't cut away from anything. They play the whole Yeah, you can tell they had some friends track. who were like, hey, can you uh, throw my new rap song? My new my new track? So, I, I mean, there was stuff about this movie that I liked. I thought that the acting felt like a real group of friends. When shit gets scary or whatever and I mean, obviously that stuff sucks but when they're hanging around just talking shit like that felt real i but i like bet it was friends. that's, yeah. a, that's I bet the thing is was. that it's not you can tell <laughs> it wasn't aren't. scripted there was no screenplay the only that. people in this movie that were actors were like the people the white people in the um who got out of the car in that one scene were like we're out of gas and we're like screaming and like hitting the car and stuff i do think that i do think that like the core group of three people that they used were people who were considering being actors there was the the dude who gets axed first 
and like has like the little love triangle thing going on and then those two women mm. they had scripted dialogue at some point in time in the story and that was part of the process but the rest of them were just there to fucking goof off and they show it in spades there was literally dude, the a dude mama joke scene was so fucking funny oh you mean the only <laughs> one where there's a mic where there's an actual microphone that's not the onboard mic but then when he handed it to anybody else in the audience, you couldn't hear a goddamn thing they said. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, the the scene where that dude gets axed, they go out to the out to the front yard to try to run away, and then he's under the hood of the car, and then they all come running back into the house. There's a dude who literally makes eye contact with the camera and goes when they're inside of the house. Like it's like the people that they got to do this are laughably bad. And like I said, that that for me, ups the entertainment value, but I mean, technically, this is pri- um, like if I could give it a zero, I'd give it a zero. Well, let's do it. I'm ready. Let's give it a score. All right, so for entertainment value, I gave this a two and a half. The scenes that where you actually can make out the audio for them are very unintentionally funny. Someone was taking this seriously, at least as far as the making of this. this and this was something that someone spent a lot of time doing, and it's ridiculous <laughs> how awful it turned out. But there are some things that are intentionally meant to be funny, like the like the Yo Mama joke scene. That was actually funny, you know, in some situations. Yeah. But it like that's probably the best thing you can say is that this movie has some entertainment value in just how laughably poorly it was made. I'm gonna go with a three. I I, I mean I was pretty entertained. I would watch it again. I would like the quality that I watched it in to be better, so I could actually hear what's going on. But I mean, I like. A slasher, <laughs> if that's what you want to call it. And it's a cabin in the woods. It reminded me a little bit of kind of a Friday the 13th version, um, like a low, a lower budget Friday the 13th yeah. made with your friends. And I like that idea because we're going to do some shit. Yeah, um, I'm going to give it a two because um, if, I, if I'm being honest, like, yeah, there were one or two funny parts where I was like, huh. <laughs> and outside of that, I was incredibly bored just because I couldn't like... Yeah. It, it was frustrating to watch. Like, it's frustrating to be like, okay, I have to watch an hour. I mean, thank God that the movie, the movie, in it's quotes, like 70 minutes. is like 70 minutes long. So, <laughs> but, it's still feature length time, ran- time frame, but it's... it's. But yeah. I was sitting there like, oh, maybe I should write while, like, while this is playing. Or maybe... Because literally there was nothing about anything happening on the TV yeah. that was catching my attention. And then occasionally the audio would flip to like... Uh, then a, like a rap song or something would come on and, and catch my attention. I'd be like, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, yeah, and then the song and the song would end, and I'd be like, oh no, this is boring again. So yeah, I'll give it a two. All right. So for me, the technical standpoint, like I said before, it's a one. It is the it is the biggest technical failure I have ever seen as far as a movie that is considered to be a feature length actual film that was sold to people. It is that bad. The audio is absolute garbage. Um, the shooting is very amateur, which that would be fine if you could hear what was going on and there was a half decent story being told, but there's just, there's nothing there. Like there's no like real gore effects at all. The shooting location is often very poorly lit as well. And it's just, Oh no, it's lit bro. And (laughs) as far as like the way that it's edited, there are so many continuity errors and there are so many things where they, where they show you the same take or like two different takes of the same line read multiple times with like leftover laughter or like, like I said, allowing actors to go and do things like breaking the fourth wall by accident or on purpose. Like, I mean, there's just so many things to say about how you, you literally hear the director me. shout "cut" at the end of one of the scenes. Yeah, yeah, which is I, crazy because then you could pick, you could hear him just fine. Couldn't hear anybody else. That's because he's on the camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with everything that you just said. So I'll go with the one as well. We're not allowed to give it a zero points. No, one is the one is the lowest. All right. Yeah, gets a one for sure. All right. And then as far as the story goes, for me, it's also a one. Continuity errors abound. Some of the worst acting of the bunch, um, at least good and bad acting that was meant to try to be good acting. And then as far as like a screenplay is concerned, there really isn't anything there. I will say for sure, as far as like the way that the technical aspect cuts into how the story is portrayed, like this isn't just like the worst horror movie I've ever seen. This is probably like the worst movie I've ever seen, period. As far as that's concerned, there are definitely things that I dislike more about our final film, <laughs> but that's more just from my sensibilities and yeah. less of just like a an objective. This movie is fucking awful. Yeah. Technically. Technically speaking. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so story. I mean, for me, I'll, I'll, I'll go too because it was like, hey, there's this kind of background information and then there's a very, very thin plot 
Um, and I like the idea of Cabin in the Woods and teens getting murdered. That's up our wheelhouse. So I'll go two on that. Yeah, I'm going to give it a two also just because, again, it was a case of, yeah, the actual storytelling was pretty bad, but there was a story. Like, we knew what the story was. We got it in the beginning, basically, and then just played out. Right. Dude killing some people in the woods. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, 1.5, 2. I'll, I'll round up. All right. So that brings the total score rounding up from its 15.5 to a 16 out of 45, which is pretty rough, considering... <laughs> <laughs> uh, considering the lowest score you could get is a nine so that's barely off i mean there's almost no reason to watch this movie other than just to see how it's not god a movie off- just to see just to see how god awful it is all right man let's get into this fucking um, this yeah last I, w- movie. I wanted i wanted to take a, a pee break before we got into defending my movie you really want to defend this yeah i think there's some defendable Here, stuff about it here's my biggest problem but i picked it this, for a reason and i'll explain movie. that yeah. Is uh, it's not really a Wait, horror okay. movie. Before we start, we got to talk. We got to say what we're talking about. All right, oh, so we're talking about the Greasy Strangler. Yeah, this was my pick, the Greasy Strangler. So yeah, like I was saying, it's not really a horror movie. It's at the most, it's a comedy with horror elements. It's like okay, if Shaun of the Dead is the best example of a comedy with horror elements, this is the fucking worst example of a comedy with horror elements. If you even want to call them horror elements, like he kills people i guess i don't know yeah uh, but i mean i don't think that that i mean it has horror in its in its yeah. roots i mean that's not something to give it negative points for i would say yeah i mean i would say that to me it definitely qualifies as a horror movie on some different levels like the, the reason that i picked this movie in the first place was because i wanted to pick a movie that i thought would win based on sheer like just being completely off the wall like i didn't want to pick something that was bad because like it was shot really like i mean like axum it's bad because it's shot poorly like there's a bad story greasy strangler is a well-made movie like it was well produced well made like it's from a legit director people like this movie but it's it, it's for a very specific kind of person um, it's for people who love like the, the John Waters type movies, like the really weird movies, you know, movies like freaks or like pink flamingos or something like that. Like the really weird kind of movies. It's not, I'm not, I'm not going to defend it as a movie that I generally would go out of my way to watch. And it's not a movie that I will say I enjoyed watching, which is why I felt like it was going to hit a chord with you guys. And I was really excited for you to watch it. It made me is, so fucking uncomfortable. Which is what I was going for is I was like, I want this movie to get points for being like this movie probably will get very low points in terms of being uh, the entertainment scale for people some for most people because to me it's it was really entertaining and just that i was like what the fuck is going on like this movie is so completely batshit but i would say that that to me it qualifies as a horror movie beyond just like the fact that there are the horror scenes of him going in and strangling people but the whole like premise of a guy who dips himself in lard like and goes around on nighttime adventures is gross and horrific and just the way the characters act to me they feel like horror movie characters they feel like kind of david lynch style like weird characters that don't really exist in real life you would hope yeah i just i got about halfway through and i wanted so badly to turn it off yeah and then i took like an hour break and then watched the rest of it and i just i powered through it in one go i hated it and i hated every second of it as far as that goes so for anyone who doesn't know the basic premise of the greasy strangler um this is a movie where there's an elderly man and his son his middle-aged son live together and they run like a local, basically it's a scam. It's a local like, uh, disco, uh, tour, disco tour, walking, disco, tour. walking, walking disco tour in their town. And, and, uh, basically on one of the tours, they meet this woman and the movie kind of revolves both around the old man being the, the, the notorious greasy strangler, which is that he dips himself in grease and strangles people to death. I think at, it's at notorious, night. but nobody knows anything about it. Yeah, and so you're it kind of almost has like an American psycho esque, like, is this happening or is he just imagining it sort of thing? Definitely don't want to compare this movie to American Psycho and I mean other you've already respects, said American but... Psycho and David Lynch, dude. So <laughs> you've already, you've already put this fucking thing on a pedestal. So you, so, you, be say, on. so you are out on a very, very long plank right now. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean uh and then and then there's this love triangle thing happening between the two guys it's and fucking the, bizarre. Yeah, it's very strange, very uncomfortable. Um, very disgusting it has a lot of that awful sound design that i hate of like greasy things and people eating and slurping and stuff like that it, this movie is meant 100 percent to be a satire which i don't think it works as and to get under your skin which it does very well mm-hmm. it's like 
awkward scenes from teen comedies like Edge 17 or Napoleon Dynamite where it's so awkward, but then it's like, oh, that's kind of funny. See, now this I, just isn't funny. Yeah, I felt I felt that kind of vibe as well. Uh, but I was thinking something more along the lines of observe and report where it has things that are meant to be funny, but also meant to be very cringy and bad mm -hmm. that make some of those moments not funny. Right. And I think that is it, I think there are things about this that you can take away that that are funny. And I think that it has some inherent value in quotability. That's what I'm looking for. Bullshit uh, artist. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, there are definitely some some fucking weird off the wall things that you could say to your friends that if they've seen it, it's going to take them back to a really terrible place. But I think that it has some value in that regard. But I think the things that they were trying to do with it are just going to go over most most viewers heads. And I don't and I didn't like it, you know? Yeah. I, I do really do think that there is an audience for this movie. It's just not us, which is what I was hoping for. Like that. And that's the only reason that I'm like going so hard to defend it is I'm trying to defend it as like, this should be the winner of like the worst <laughs> movie that we watched because to me, it's like on a different level. And yeah. I brought my fucking B movie game and that was not, not enough. Low enough. <laughs> no, not, a, not enough, bud. I yeah. Mean, because this one, like the other one's like, uh, it made you feel a little bit dirty. This one like gets under your skin. It's in your blood. Makes yeah. your blood feel, it makes your heart, your arteries feel clogged, you know? I don't think this is the worst movie we watched, but I think this is the movie that makes you feel the worst when you watch it. I think that's the best description. Depends on what you're defining as like the worst, right? Because yours technically was the worst, and this technically was is the, the best. best movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But oh my god, let's go into the fucking ratings. All right, so <laughs> so entertainment for me, I'm gonna put it at a two because, like I said, because of the quotability and obviously the bonus the bonus amount for nudity, which. Does it count in this one? Because it's pretty rough. It counts. We didn't put any parameters on this. We just said if there's nudity, it gets extra points. Uh, for me, it's 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 a it's a one. The only thing I liked was bullshit artist, which ended up becoming annoying. And then the scene where he gives the blind dude a ten dollar <laughs> <laughs> a ten dollar bill and wrote ten dollars on it, but it's like he wouldn't see it anyway. <laughs> so why not just give him the paper? Yeah. Uh, that was funny, and I was like, that's fucked up, but that's pretty funny. You didn't think the ending was heartwarming? No, <laughs> I didn't understand what was happening. Even he, they, he accepted the son accepted himself as a as a greasy strangler, and they they became closer. At but the then end. they think that hunters are killing them. Oh yeah, I forgot. Then it gets really weird. Okay, never mind. Yeah, and then you're like, wait, what? And then they run. Uh, uh, yeah, for me, yeah, entertainment, a fucking one at best. Yeah, I'm gonna give it a two. I think it, I think it, it deserves a good two. I was entertained. Okay. All right. So as far as technical is concerned, probably the biggest selling point of this movie is that it's a well-made movie. So as far as the technical is concerned, uh, the shooting's not terrible. The effects that they use, like the dude's fake dick, like are pretty rough. Some of the, go like the gore is a very specific style of gore. It almost kind of reminded me of like who framed Roger Rabbit a little bit with the way mm -hmm. the eyes bulge out of people's heads and shit. Yeah. And like when he that like punches that punch dude in the face. <laughs> Um, it like caves in like a Barbie doll. <laughs> exactly. Like it's like it's it has a very like cartoonish quality to it. And for me, while that's not anything that I like, it is something. <laughs> so I would say that this for me and technical standpoint is a three. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean technically, yeah. Yeah. I, I guess I I guess I would say uh, that's tough to say. Because yeah, technically I guess a four. Yeah, I mean it's te technically it's fine. Yeah, I would say definitely compared to our other two movies, this is a technically a four. It's yeah. a it's a well made movie. Some of the nighttime shots I think look really good. Like I I, I do think there's some of the panning shots, the way that they use um, dollies, like they do all of the stuff you're supposed to do. Yeah, and the town looks like they're going for a certain style, and I think they pull it off really well. Yeah. Like they're going for the style of grungy, weird, uncanny stuff, which I think it does pretty well. So as much as I want to give it a low score because I want it to win. I think it gets a four mm -hmm. uh, in, te in the technical category. Yeah, and then story, I'm going to say a one. Script and story are abysmal and almost impossible to make any sense of. And the acting, while on purpose, is fucking horrible. <laughs> like, I mean, people like that do not exist that talk that way. It's almost robotic to a fault. Like, they on purpose make it seem like they're just acting well poorly. they seem to be to me they and i'm not an expert on this but they seem to be in the vein of like the tim and eric style mm -hmm. of humor they very much feel like they would be like really really fucked up characters pulled from like a tim and eric or an eric andre like adult swim thing which i think that's not in the wheelhouse of most of the people in the room yeah one yeah at best again it, there's basically no plot it's just here scenes of nothing that we give a shit about 
Yeah. And and there's like two different stories, if you want to call them that, that don't have any relevance to each other. Uh, yeah, one. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's just a collection of like weird, random, gross shit that they thought was funny. So I'd say it's a one. It definitely is a lot more of just a mixed bag of random shit than the other two movies were. Like, just because the other two were very simple, this felt like somebody had something they felt was very high concept. Like, in their head, they probably thought this was, like, an amazing idea. Like, this was going to really fuck people up. All right. So, as far as the scoring is concerned, Perez and I both gave this a six. You gave this a seven, bringing the total to 19. Where's my fart sound? (laughs) Hold on. Let me get a fart. I mean, Axum lost. Axum lost. Axum is the Axum is the worst movie. Ah, I disagree with that. Rudy Tootie Disco. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> Rudy Tootie Disco Booty. Disco so Cutie. I think. Cutie, yeah. yeah. Rudy Tootie Disco Cutie. I was getting so fucking irritated, dude. I wanted to throw my remote. So. That's the thing about this is, like I said, I think that we all took different uh, different approaches to this. Perez tried to find a mo- an overall bad movie, but a redeemable bad movie. That was still a movie. Yeah, you, you, it was you, still you, a movie. You followed the rules and you picked a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I went for something that was technically the worst thing that I'd ever seen, which... Which to me was just a collection of clips of friends hanging out together. I mean, and it's meant, it's like I said, you can tell it was all shot like in a weekend. Like they meant to make this into a movie. It just does not play off that way. And then you picked a movie that was the worst experience to watch. I would say close to ever for me. Like nice, like th- like very low on the, like I think movie 43 is probably the worst thing I've ever seen. And I watched that in theaters. That movie fucking sucks. Uh, this is pretty fucking close to that. No, this is worse. Then movie 43? No. Yeah. No. It, it's at least one thing. Like, every single thing from movie 43, all of the clips, the overarching story, everything about that movie just makes me want to vomit. So is the uh, so is the cap to this episode that n- the three of our movies lost to more movie 43, and we've all agreed that movie 43 is the... <laughs> so you get the gold medal... At the shit Olympics, Anthony, you get the silver and I get the bronze. Yeah, so um, if we ever do this again, which based on the fact that the Greasy Strangler exists, I don't know if I want to open myself up to that again. Oh, open yourself up to the Greasy Strangler, John, please. <laughs> God. Um, um, you would let have him to, inside you. You would have to pay me to watch that movie again. So if that isn't a stunning endorsement from the Porcelain Peak team, I don't know. I, th- I You know, I say check it out. Make sure you're eating like a, like a big bowl of spaghettios or like like a stew or something i'm, I'm like, physically God. sick because <laughs> <laughs> like i said i i mean while i don't necessarily agree that the scores dictate exactly which movie was the worst of this like i said the worst the worst movie as far as movies are concerned is axum the worst experience as far as a movie provides was greasy strangler by a mile wasn't even fucking close and we found pinata as a hidden gem that we'll revisit every year <laughs> around cinco de mayo <laughs> oh i mean i would i would i would fucking watch pinata 10 times before i would watch well yeah see like pinata movies. is a movie that i'd be like hey you want to get some friends together and watch pinata i would never bore people getting them together to watch axum and i would never want any of my friends to watch the greasy strangler if well, i wanted to like oh, try so it what the like, fuck are we? <laughs> uh business partners <laughs> <laughs> business consig- consigliere <laughs> let's get to the watch list Oh, fuck. Yeah, so let's hop into that watch list. (laughs) Patrick, what is it? Where are you going? I've got to return some video, Dave. All right, this week for me, I would like to recommend Ready or Not because I needed something to cleanse my palate after watching these movies, and that one was actually pretty good. I don't know if that's the people that I want homing scream, but I did enjoy it, and some of the gore was pretty decent. And I was not expecting it to kind of go in the twist that it did at the end. And I was like, whoa, all right, cool. Um, And uh, yeah, it was enjoyable. It was entertaining. And it was way better than whatever I had watched. So maybe that's the key to watching those kind of schlocky one-off Blumhouse movies is to watch a bunch of shit before it. And then it's not too bad. I feel like like Ready or Not was better than the the schlocky stuff. Because it at least tries. Yeah. You know, I think that watching that over something like Truth or Dare is definitely you know which movie is better of those two oh, yeah. by a by like no contest. That's funny because I actually compared it to Truth or Dare when I sat down to watch it. I said, like, "Well, hey, this can't be any worse than Truth or Dare," and it's not. Yeah, and it's not. It's definitely on my list of things I need to rewatch because I just don't think I was like really in the mood for it when I saw it, which happens sometimes. Like if I go to a movie and I'm like, 
I'm going because I got invited and I really had no interest in seeing this movie in the first place. You know, then I kind of go maybe went in with a bad attitude. Yeah. Um, so I think I'll I'll probably check it out again now yeah. that I've had multiple uh, recommendations for it. I do recommend. Uh, it's been very close since the last time we recorded, so I don't have a whole lot new as far as things I've been watching, but I have been going back through, like I said, and rewatching some of the Scary Game Squad playthroughs on Jesse Cox's YouTube channel, and those are excellent. Uh, like I said, I would definitely suggest to check out either of the Resident Evil playthroughs. He did seven and two. So if you're not looking to buy the games, they're a good way to get into those. And then um, Until Dawn, like I said, even if you've already played it or you intend to play it, their playthrough and how they kind of went through the process is absolutely fucking hilarious. I would definitely suggest to watch that. And I'm still reading Lost Causes of Bleak Creek. So um, I would say it, it's good so far. I'm about a quarter of the way in. So I'm going to keep plugging away at that but i think i intend to by the next time we record to start devs which is supposed to be mm. very good yeah i'm excited about that i keep forgetting so i need to put that in my phone or something yeah so i did the exact same thing that you did anthony where i thought okay everything is uphill after these movies <laughs> so um i decided to hop on to shutter because i was like hey shutter's probably got some good horror stuff and i was still in the mood for horror but i was like i gotta watch something that has like some good reviews and and so went on there and perused around a little bit and if you're not already on shutter and you're a fan of horror i think this is like a perfect time i think they're doing a 30-day free trial now for people um i think before it used to be like a seven-day trial so anyway uh first recommendation i have is for a i believe it's a 2016 movie yeah 2016 it's called The Transfiguration. So this movie is about a young boy, young uh, black boy in the inner city, I believe. Um, he lives with his, bro his brother. His mom passed away. Oh, and he thinks he's turning into a vampire? Yeah. So basically his bit is that he is... It's, it, it reminded me a lot of a couple movies. American Psycho, I'll bring up again, just because it kind of has that blurred reality. Is he, is he not doing specific actions in the movie? And then also it reminded me a little bit of Let the Right One In. Right, yeah. This movie leans a lot more on like making you very unsure about what's happening for the entirety of the movie. But basically, yeah, the kid is just obsessed with vampires. He's always reading vampire comics. He's always watching vampire movies in his room. He has like a VHS collection where you see it says like Fright Night and let the right one in. And he references like he lives in this world where all of this, hor this horror vampire media exists. And he feels like he is a vampire. And he, and he feels very alone. And he meets a girl who is also a loner. And they kind of, it kind of starts to mess with him a little bit. So that movie was enjoyable. It's very slow. Mm -hmm. Definitely doesn't have anything flashy going on. But very well shot. Um, really well acted. Surprisingly kind of heartfelt. Um, yeah, I remember enjoying it when I watched it. Yeah, it's cool. The movie I have a super, super high recommendation for that I'm very, very excited to talk about is a movie that recently showed up on Shudder that I had heard about called Bliss. Hmm. This movie was absolutely savage. It was awesome. So basically this artist, she lives in like, I don't know, New York or something. She's got like a studio apartment. She's working on this huge painting and she cannot make a breakthrough on this painting. And she's trying to, which I, I was immediately interested in the premise, like, you know, coming from that angle. So she's trying to finish this painting and she starts experimenting with this drug called Bliss and starts ex just going on these crazy like alcohol and drug benders to try and then she'll have these like blackout breakthroughs while so she just keeps doing it and the movie kind of takes you along for the ride in terms of being there's even a warning in the very beginning of the movie that says like this uses a lot of flashing strobe lights so for anyone like it's, it has a seizure warning basically the movie is reminding me a lot of mandy in terms of the way it's shot it's all every scene is colored bathed in like red and blue and, and green lights very very quick cuts crazy score flashing lights insane stuff on these drug trips some amazing imagery but basically she starts doing this drug starts going kind of crazy finds out that she has a little bit of a taste for blood because mm. of the as a side effect of whatever's happening to her with this drug and shit hits the fan and it's awesome I had such a good time with this movie. I did not even once during it want to pick up my phone and look at it. I was like, nice. I was super, super into it. Uh, and when it was done, I was like, fuck, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. I feel like I'm in this time right now where I'm I'm wanting to get into more like extreme horror movies just because I, I feel like I'm like calloused now, like about, uh, for, about horror movies. So those ones that really just like go, it's very gory, um, really intense. So yeah, Sigh. high recommendation for Bliss, which is on Shudder. So check it out. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for watch list and wrap it up for this episode. So next week, what we're going to do is we're going to watch Tales from the Crypt episode. Yes. This was sort of a parallel to our Twilight Zone random episodes that we did in season one. And Anthony was like, hey, let's do Tales from the Crypt. And John and I jumped on board with that because Crypt Creeper is fucking terrifying. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's no Rod Serling, 
but they, <laughs> they probably look the same now. We're basically taking the Twilight Zone idea, and we're getting grungier, we're getting dirtier, we're getting more <laughs> profane, we're getting some titties, probably, it's HBO. So right. if you <laughs> want to join with us, we are going to be watching... Corman's Calamity, which is episode 19, episode 86, which is Cold War, episode 5, which is Lover Come Hack to Me, episode 88, Report from the Grave, episode 15, Four-Sided Triangle, and episode 43, which is Beauty Rest. The first two, John will be watching, the next two, Anthony Silva will be watching, and then the last two, I will be watching, and then we're just going to compare, similar to how we did with those Twilight Zone episodes. I'm pretty excited. I am not super familiar with this show, and I don't think I've seen a lot of episodes if I've seen any, like, sat down and watched them. So I am looking forward to this. Yeah, I'm intimately familiar with the show because I, I, my dad even, um, because I mentioned it in my new YouTube video, Here Be Monsters, YouTube, Here Be Monsters. (laughs) How many times do you think you want to plug it today? (laughs) And uh, my dad actually came over the other day, and he was like, so I guess watch, uh, having you sit down and watch those episodes of Tales from the Crypt uh, when you were five years old uh, did you some good, huh? And he was like, I guess I wasn't such a bad parent. <laughs> and no like, one said that, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody said that at all. But yeah, I'm super excited. I think it's going to be good. And I'll, I'll probably be throwing those um, episodes up on social media just in case anybody wants to check it out. I think all of Tales from the Crypt at this point is on YouTube, or the majority of it is on YouTube. And you're really probably not going to find better quality unless you find the DVDs. It's pretty scarce. So I'd say anybody who wants to check out these episodes, you can probably just Google the episode titles and look them up, and they are uh, probably be pretty easy to find. Yeah, and it's going to be a massive shade better than what we had to endure this time. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, I'm looking forward to some quality. <laughs> yeah, it almost felt like we were doing like a micro 31 Terror Tales. Oh, yeah, we oh, had some shit weeks. But I don't know. I mean, there are some bad things in 31 Terror Tales, but nothing... <laughs> <laughs> Nothing on on the same wavelength as Greasy Strangler. Yeah, so much like the tagline for Alien vs. Predator, whoever wins, we lose. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that is going to wrap it up completely for this week. I have been Anthony. I have been John. And I'm also Anthony. And we thank you so much for listening. See you guys next week. Keep it creepy. You can find Porcelain Peak on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, Spotify, TuneIn, and Stitcher. Wherever you listen, don't forget to rate, review, share, and subscribe so you never miss a spine-tingling episode. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and at PorcelainPeak.com for additional content. Special thanks to Randy Greer for composing the Porcelain Peak intro music and to Anthony Silva for designing the Porcelain Peak logo. All episodes and additional content is hosted, written, produced, designed, and edited by the Porson Peak team, consisting of Anthony Perez, John Brasher, and Anthony Silva. This has been here for this fair, a weirdos production.